this is these things are new. The other things are left over from our trend. Translation <coughs> run. Some of maybe. So that's probably what I'm saying. This is so if anybody needs a transcript, uh, the nice. machines give out or anything, we can provide it. I guess sure. I am, I think, by the prearrangement. All right. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question that comes out of the interview with the TV anchor man, in which you referred, I think, twice to, uh, well, you said that the start was another gigantic step toward the elimination of nuclear weapons. And you also said that at Reykjavik, uh, we had come to an agreement on literally total nuclear disarmament when the Soviets brought up SDI, and you came home. And then Mr. Gorbachev is using the same kind of language on his way over here with Mrs. Thatcher. And I'm just wondering what you and the general secretary imagine, what kind of world you imagine, uh, what kind of relationship between the two systems that would permit uh, a world without nuclear weapons? Well, he made it very plain that uh, in, in Reykjavik, when we were talking there, that. Uh, he was interested in the whole uh, gamut, and it came out of a discussion in which we had constantly talked missiles, and he finally wanted to know why we weren't talking weapons, arms, because there are more than missiles. There are battlefield artillery shells that are nuclear. There are bombs from airplanes and so forth. And uh, I was kind of surprised, because I thought that, that uh, they might be more prone to wanting nuclear weapons than us, and it surprised me. And I said, well, that's good enough for me. I'm willing to talk all weapons. But suddenly, and this was on the very last day, suddenly uh, up came this other, that it was all at the price of not having any uh, strategic defense initiative. And uh, that's where I walked away. Well, aren't, aren't you in <clears throat> danger of making the world safe for conventional war and putting the Europeans at some risk when you talk about no nuclear weapons? It's no, but I think there is such a difference between nuclear and conventional as we've, as we've always known it. And that is the idea that two countries are basing their mutual defense uh, on what's called the MAD policy, mutual assured destruction, that, uh, that the preventive is supposed to be that, well, if they push the button and all those missiles in less than a half an hour are here exploding all over our country, we will have pushed the buttons also, and though they'll be exploding all over their country. And it seems to me that to begin with is such a violation <laughs> as to the rules of warfare that were violated also in World War II, but that how uncivilized are we if we simply now say that uh, all people, men, women, and children, non-combatants, are going to be the target of these, this new weapon when we've had rules of warfare adopted by all the civilized world that is to protect the non-combatant from being a victim of war. Well, I just follow up. I mean, we did firebomb Tokyo in World War II, and non-combatants were involved, and among other things. Yes, I but say I we violated it. We did break it. When Hitler created a thing called total war, well, we followed suit I and still uh, worry about proved to be Europe. better at it than he was. How worried would you be about the conventional imbalance in Europe if you just did away with all the No, weapons? that, of course, is most important. And I have to say, uh, with regard to uh, the general secretary, uh, he has made it plain that in his wanting a, a reduction of armaments, uh, that extends to conventional weapons also. But what um, reassurance can you offer to our conservative friends that these, this INF treaty uh, is in the national interest and in their interests? And well, it is, and I know that most of the things we hear is that they believe that somehow 
by this INF agreement, uh, we have changed the balance of power in Europe and that the, con the Soviets, who do have, admittedly, a conventional superiority, are now have been given an advantage. But that isn't so. There are still hundreds and hundreds of nuclear weapons left in Europe. The tactical battlefield weapons, and those are the weapons that do equalize that imbalance in conventional weapons. Now, before you would go into any uh, treaty about those tactical battlefield weapons, that would have to follow parity in the conventional weapons. Because if we eliminated and they eliminated the tactical battlefield weapons, they automatically would end up with a great superiority if it was reduced to conventional weapons. And in this instance, I feel they're so wrong because uh, they are giving up four times as many warheads as we have to give up. In our Pershings and, uh, and uh, uh, cruise missiles, we didn't have anywhere near the number of warheads. And their intermediate range missiles were not targeted on military targets. They covered all the way to London. In, in other words, every principal city and uh, uh, port and so forth in Europe was open to that particular weapon. Sir, this is a very sharp, specific answer that you've given that I'm sure would silence Howard Phillips for a few minutes. But, there, but Phillips and guys like that, then they would also rush back and say, I suspect, has our uh, ideological leader softened up? How would you reassure them that you still are vigilant as regards uh, the uh, danger of communism to world peace? Well, <clears throat> when I got my temper back after a charge of that kind, <laughs> I think I would make it very plain to them that, uh, no, I haven't softened up. I have believed from the very beginning that our best posture had to be strength and realism. And when I first, in 1961, brought up the idea of a zero option, and they walked out of the discussions and said they wouldn't be back. 1981, sir? Yes, that was the first time that I ever thought about it. Um, and said they wouldn't be back. Well, I didn't give in, and they came back. And in Reykjavik, uh, when they wanted SDI done away with, <laughs> I walked away, and they came back. I believe you deal from strength, and I think they got the idea that uh, we weren't just hungry for a detente and that we would sign anything to uh, pretend that we had some kind of an agreement. Let me follow up on that, really. I, I was uh, rereading your uh, British Parliament speech from 1982. And it says, uh, the Soviet Union is running against the tide of history and that Marxism, Leninism is on the ash heap or is going to end up on the ash heap of history. And then uh, he, here you are on this happy, obviously in a yeah. good mood, happy first name basis with, with uh, uh, the general secretary. You have conservative critics at home, as Bob mentioned, calling you, I guess it was Howard Phillips said that you're selling the Soviet case. You are in Lenin's term, a, a useful idiot. A, and um, what so many people are wondering is, you know, why is this man, Ronald Reagan, smiling it, uh, under such circumstances? And listening to your last answer, what I am speculating, and I, I'd like to, you to comment on it if you could, is this. Is it possible, I mean, everybody's looking to saying, what's the big picture this week? And is it possible that you believe that what the turning point is and the watershed of this week is that we in the West are winning. And that's why you're so happy. In other words, they came to INF because the Europeans deployed. They're after the deep cuts because they're afraid of SDI. They're talking about getting out of Afghanistan uh, because they're taking a beating there. They're going into perestroika because their, their system is, is, is gone down the tubes. So I'm sitting here saying, maybe Ronald Reagan is so happy because he's saying, we're, a, we're winning, and this is the turning point. Well, I don't like to put it on that term when we are uh, arriving at agreements in which we're both satisfied 
for example, in this treaty we've just signed, the, there's never been an agreement signed between us that has the verification features that this one does. We've gone as far, I believe, as can be, can be done. And I think the winners are the people uh, who are going to benefit from this. You have to remember that this is the fourth Soviet leader uh, in my term as president. And this is the first Soviet leader that has openly discussed uh, Glasnost, that there are flaws in their economic system that need correcting, and uh, which maybe partially confirms some of the things that I said before about their, their system, because some of the things he wants to do are uh, real departures from what has been the, uh, the general policy. Now, he's, uh, he's loyal to their philosophy, but he believes that there are things that, uh, that need correcting. And as I said, he has talked uh, voluntarily on what he sees as a need for all of us to reduce military forces, not just nuclear power, that they are a drain on the citizenry and uh, that we would all be better off if we didn't have such vast uh, military do, machines. Do, do you still think that Marxism-Leninism is going to end up on the ash heap of history? <laughs> well, he, of course, probably thinks capitalism is going to end up on the ash heap of history. But uh, yes, I've, I've always believed that, that the, greatest, the greatest revolution in the history of man, I think, that ever, maybe I've gone too far, but that I really believe that occurred <clears throat> was in this country with three words, we the people. Now, every other country in the world has a constitution, but virtually all of them, I only know of one exception other than ourselves, all of them, their constitutions have, we the government permit you the people the following privileges and rights. Our constitution is so unique because it says we the people permit government the following rights. And we make it specific in that Constitution that nothing not openly given in that Constitution to government, no power can be taken by government. Everything that isn't mentioned remains in the hands of the people. And uh, I would say that on comparison, down over the years, 200 years now, uh, our, our revolution proved to be the correct one. You only have to compare what has been accomplished. Sir, can I ask you, how did you feel this morning when you woke up? Did you, is this the happiest day of your life? <laughs> well, I, I felt good. I think that yesterday was, was quite a day after a years of, of uh, debate and discussion and walking away from things with Without settlement, uh, I thought it was quite a, quite a day. You looked happy all day. Yes. Uh, sir, and the, uh, the regional issues, um, I know that this hasn't been settled yet, but do you see that this is going to move Afghanistan, Middle East Peace, uh, International Peace Conference? Do you see anything yet, or is it too early? Well, there are people involved in the Middle East situation who uh, do not see an international uh, panel as the as the answer, and obviously you can't impose it on them. Uh, they have to uh, they have to be willing for that. But I do believe also that uh, this general secretary uh, feels as we do about uh, the futility and the tragedy of the Iran Iraq war. Uh, joined us in adopting the the UN uh, resolution five nine eight about calling on Iran and Iraq to, to end their war. And uh, yes, I, I think that some of this uh, can cause Im improved relations in other places. And I know that our allies in Europe, in spite of uh, a lot of talk that they aren't happy about this, uh, that isn't what I'm hearing from mm -hmm. them. They, they're very pleased with what has been done. Mr. President, I, I 
I derive from what you said that really that your view has not changed, but that it is quite conceivable that you are dealing with a new kind of Soviet leader, and this is what is bringing this about. Possibly the fundamental change is that in the past, uh, Soviet leaders have openly expressed uh, their acceptance of the Marxian theory of the one world communist state, that their obligation was to expand and make the whole world it. Uh, I no longer feel that way. I think, I think uh, we're dealing with an, an administration that, and this doesn't mean that I'm dropping my guard or anything, but that we have a potential here of a recognition that we have two systems that are competitive, that uh, aren't alike, that have different values, but a desire to prove that we can live in the world together at peace. And this is what is... This is what I've been seeing in the discussions day day. In, these, in these three meetings and, uh, and even more in this last meeting uh, with the General Secretary, that the Soviet Union uh, is expressing a belief in, uh, in our, uh, yes, competitive societies, but living in peace in the, in the world together. Now, again, as I say, and I don't think either one of us are going to drop our guard, we're going to insist on, well, as they, he pointed out yesterday that I have said in every meeting, yes, dovayai no provayai, <laughs> trust but verify. <laughs> Professor, where did you, when what? you got that, just, what? just a little question, where did you find that proverb? <laughs> I can't remember exactly who brought it to my attention, but it was way back before the first Geneva meeting. And uh, someone called attention, and I used it in the first meeting. <laughs> does, this, has, does this mean that, that you expect the, the uh, Soviets to pull out of Afghanistan soon and stop supporting the Sandinistas soon in Nicaragua? They have, he has expressed, and as in, in fact, not just to me, but publicly, that they want to get out of Afghanistan. And uh, I can't go beyond that other than that saying that our people are people we have working on all of these things are working on that particular question right now as to when and how. And in Nicaragua? Well, we've made the same point there with regard to, uh, to Nicaragua and, it, uh, and pointed out the similarity in the, in the two situations. And Mr. President. So again, that's being worked on. Has, has the General Secretary ever said what you've said, which is that you think the possibility the possible fundamental change that's going on is that the Soviet leaders are no longer seeking world domination. I know they no longer go around making the affirmative case that that's what they yes. see, but I have not seen, I, to my knowledge, that they have said what you have just said, which is that they are no longer seeking. Uh, no, he has never said, said that, but again, but he is the that, first. That's your feeling. He is the first and only leader that has never affirmed that. Uh, that has never stood up there before the uh, their great Soviet Congress and and uh, and uh, openly stated that goal as the others all have. And but he's again, never said I have he's... to say that no, in our discussions, just the things that uh, he's willing to discuss and to talk about uh, in the relationship uh, is evidence to me of. Uh, that he's looking for us uh, really competing but living peacefully together in the world. And, and that really represents, I mean, a, a watershed change either in what has happened there or in what has happened as to your perception. I mean, you believed all along, as many of us did, that the Soviets were seeking global domination, uh, and you're now saying that, that they're not. Or, or, or that the evidence for the moment... The evidence is, yeah, right. is that. And uh, so let's just put it that I'm watching carefully. One Mr. President, yesterday, uh, the Secretary General at the afternoon session even went so far as to say that we come from the same civilizations, which would back yes. up what you... I don't think they've ever said that before, have they? No. 
Is that Nor a have key? I ever heard anyone say before what he said the other day. Which was that? That they are going to observe the millennia, the thousandth anniversary of the baptizing of a Christian in the Soviet Union. That Christianity came to this, well, not the Soviet Union, to Russia. Mm -hmm. Christianity came to Russia a thousand years ago. That's next year, isn't it? 88, I think. Is it next year? I guess it's the coming year. That's fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> How did you like Mrs. So Gorbachev? What? How did you like Raisa Gorbachev? Oh, well, <laughs> I, she seems very pleasant. I just, uh, we just had a little moment here. Maybe I shouldn't give this away, but I will. Uh, his schedule was very busy today. And we, our meeting ran over here in the Oval Office. And uh, I kept, finally, and I told him, I said, I've been told that I'm to take him over to the diplomatic entrance there to meet his wife, who was with Nancy, and then so they could go on with their schedule. And then when we got there, we found out that Nancy and Raiza were having coffee together, and uh, they were late. <laughs> So when we stayed down there in the dip room waiting for them to come down, I suggested something to him, and we both did it, that when finally they came around and through the door, he and I were both <laughs> looking at our watches. <laughs> we got a laugh. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, speaking of, of, of the wives and the ladies, the, 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 it's, the, the story has been out that uh, Mrs. Reagan it feels very strongly about your, quotes place in history, uh, that that's really what's driving this whole thing, is that you want to go down into history books. So, what, I, what do you think about that whole line of... Uh, I don't know where they got it. Michael Lieber has got well, a book out which says this in some detail. Uh, I think that if you'll check, though, that has been said that he said that. And... Uh, I understand uh, that if he that he's either thinking or has uh, started a lawsuit over some of those statements that were made. No, all of that talking about Nancy and so forth. No, that that isn't true. And uh, well, what about the places in history argument? Forget about Mrs. Reagan for the moment. I mean, is that what's driving you? I mean, people always say no. it's almost a cliche. In the last year of a presidency, though, all the president wants to make his case for history books and that kind of stuff. Is that what's in the back of your mind? No. Right you don't become the president. You have temporary custody of an institution known as the presidency. And I don't think maybe some people have just taken it for, because of the nature of it or something. But no, I had some very strong beliefs. And if you go back about 25 years or so, you'll find that out there in the mashed potato circuit, I was voicing those before I ever thought that I would get into politics myself. In fact, I was dragged kicking and screaming <laughs> into running for office. But I, I believe very strongly in some certain things. And uh, I came here with the pledge that I was going to try to carry out those things I believed in. And uh, that's all I'm interested in. And now, getting down here to the final wire, my motivation is that we have achieved uh, quite a bit, I think. The, expansion, the economic expansion proves it. And I want to see now if I can't kind of pin some of those things down for whoever follows me, that uh, they won't just disappear without us being here. I think there are things that, uh, in the whole budgetary process, having been a governor, I have to tell all of you, I don't think there's a state in the union that has a budget process that is as Mickey Mouse as the federal governments. And uh, no state would, would put up with it. Well, and there are things that I would like yeah. to see done, such as a balanced budget amendment, and what I had as a governor, and 43 governors have, a line item veto, can stop some of the log rolling that goes on up there in the, on the hill, things of that kind. And uh, no, I, uh, I don't know what history is going to say. if. Uh, History reads a lot of the print. Uh, they're going to uh, or follows it. It's going to be quite inaccurate. Sir, in those old days, did you think about about weaponry, about 
po the even remote possibility of this kind of thing? Of what? Of, uh, of, of, of nuclear weapon cutbacks. I mean, you, you, you started out to say, you know, when you were making speeches years ago, was this on your agenda then? I mean, was this deep in your... Well, I have always felt, if you look back, there have been about 19 efforts made involving the Soviet Union, too, by administrations in this country to do something about nuclear weapons before they ever got to the extent they are now. As a matter of fact, clear back in the very beginning, the first proposal by this country was to the effect of perhaps turning nuclear power itself over to an international kind of group that could control it and uh, keep it from spreading into the weapon thing and so forth. And uh, we seem to be the only country that wanted to do that. But uh, so it never got any place. But as I say, I just happen to believe that I summed it up in that same speech that you mentioned. I summed it up in this, that a nuclear war can never be, cannot be won and must never be fought. What success is there if two countries so poison their very earth that the people can't live there, uh, who could call themselves a victor? And I think maybe there's been some effect now as we've seen the disaster at Chernobyl. I, the latest figure I've seen is that 135,000 people cannot return to where they lived because it is, it is not safe, the radioactivity and, and all that. And Chernobyl had less power than a single warhead. Now you suddenly imagine tens of thousands of warheads dropping on a country uh, and, and that country doing the same to another. Who wins? Everybody loses. I know. I thought this was just a visit we were having. Congratulations again. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, sir. You know the historians are going to base your write about your administration not based on the press, but on the American Spectator, what we say about it. <laughs> so you don't have to be so pessimistic. <laughs> not to mention TV clips. <laughs> well, I included those, yes. By the, by the press. Yes. I've noticed that most of the times when I make a speech out someplace and it's covered on the national TV programs. Uh, you see me up there talking, but you hear a voiceover telling me what I'm saying. Translation. <laughs> <laughs> Was this the happiest day of your life? <laughs> or is that oh, time? I've had, You've had a lot of happy days. Happily married, how could I say I this? can see why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is good.